Hello chess players! Today we're going to be taking a look at the Rey Lopez. Beginning after e4, e5, knight of 3 knight c6, bishop e5 begins the Rey Lopez. We're going to be taking a look at something called the Old Steinitz Variation, beginning with the move pawn to d6. If you like content like this and want to see more of it, please hit that subscribe button and click on your notification icon. So we're going to be taking a look at the Old Steinitz Variation, not to be confused with the Modern Steinitz Variation, which would begin with a6, bishop a4, pawn to d6. This position creates its own problems for white, and this is, of course, going to get its own video. So the Old Steinitz variation beginning with the move pawn to d6. What do we do against this move? How do we face it? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to establish ourselves in the middle. We need to play pawn to d4. Now, even though the opening is called the Steinitz variation, the theory for this opening actually predates Steinitz. Uh, you can reach this position via a Philidor opening, and because of that, we've got theory that dates all the way back to Paul Morphy and, of course, Adolf Anderson. So, Back then, back during Morphy's and Anderson's time, people would play the move e captures d4, and Morphy and Anderson's preference was to play this move queen captures d4. Now, I will note that there are modern players that have tried the move knight captures d4. Uh, to note, we have this Shirov versus Sulkis game that was played back in 2004, and Shirov had some sort of advantage after bishop to d7, knight c3, knight d4, bishop d7, queen d7, queen d4, and uh, you can argue that white has some sort of advantage here. White has more space, white has his queen in the middle of the board, white has more development, white should definitely have some sort of advantage. But Morphy's preference, and my preference, was just to play queen captures d4, and uh, this was also Anderson's preference, and I think queen takes d4 is totally reasonable, and we should just consider that white has some sort of advantage after queen d4. Now Morphy's intention was after bishop d7, he wanted to play bishop captures c6, and again, we have some modern examples of people choosing not to do this, where instead they decide to retreat their queen, thus keeping the bishop pair. Uh, I have a Napomniche versus Anish Guri that was played in 2020 that went down this path. Uh, that game did end in a draw, but probably Napomniche has some sort of advantage here with the white pieces just by keeping his bishop pair, and of course still having the normal advantage of having more space and having slightly better development. But both Morphy and Anderson preferred bishop takes d6, bishop takes d6, and now Morphy played an interesting game against Horowitz in Paris back in 1858, where he continued with the game with the move bishop to g5. After bishop g5, we have f6, bishop to h4, knight h6, knight c3, queen d7, castles kingside, bishop to e7, rook a d1, castles kingside, queen c4 check, rook to f7, and then we have knight d4, and of course with Morphy having more space, and aiming at black's weak squares, Morphy has an advantage here with white, and Morphy did go on to win. Now, all that being said, I actually don't like Morphy's bishop to g5 move in this position. I actually prefer the simplicity of Anderson's approach when he played the move knight to c3. And he played this move knight to c3 against Paulson in Vienna in 1873, which would have been, you know, about 20, uh, a little less than 20 years later. So he played this move knight to c3, and then in that game we had knight f6, bishop to g5, bishop to e7, castles queenside, castles kingside, rook he1, and again, I just love the simplicity of Anderson's play here, he's just putting everything in the middle, rook to e8, king to b1, just sidestepping with the king, bishop to d7, bishop f6, bishop f6, and then pawn to e5. Now what's really cool about this game is the engine seems to back all of this stuff up, it seems to think that white's doing very good. After bishop to e7 and then knight to d5, the position is clearly advantage white. White has some sort of advantage here. All of his pieces are in the center of the board, and he has more space, and everything's going really good. And the game actually continued. Bishop to f8, e takes d6, c takes d6, rook e8, bishop e8, knight d2, bishop to c6, knight e4. Again, all of white's pieces in the middle of the board. f5, knight on e to c3, queen d7, a3, queen f7, h3, a6, g4. And I'm only showing all this because the engine backs it all up. Rook e8, pawn to f4, rook to e6, g5, b5, and after h4, rook e8, queen d3, white has a decisive advantage, and white did in fact go on to win. This was Anderson versus Paulson played back in Vienna in 1873. And I honestly don't know if at any point anybody has really improved on this enough with the black pieces to justify uh, sort of playing these variations with black, you know, going all the way back to uh, 1873. I don't know if anybody has made any sort of significant improvements in this area. Now, that being said, we can go all the way back to where we play d4 
e takes d4 is of course by no means obligatory. We don't have to play e takes d4 and allow either knight takes d4 or queen d4. We can play it the way that Steinitz played it. We can play it with this move bishop to d7. And I think that this opening sort of started getting Steinitz's name because of the success that he seemed to have with this move bishop to d7. Now, that being said, uh, I think a lot of Steinitz's success with the move to bishop to d7 had more to do with his opposition and less to do with the merits of the positions themselves. Uh, for example, in this game that continued with knight to c3, and the game I'm following here is actually uh, Pillsbury versus Steinitz. Pillsbury was playing the white pieces. Uh, we have Pillsbury continuing with knight c3, and then Steinitz continues with knight to f6, and then we have bishop takes c6, bishop takes c6, queen d3. And this is actually a variation that gets repeated today. This is probably what Steinitz had in mind, sort of forcing uh, an extra tempo from white to play queen d3 before he decides to capture on the c6 square. And then once you've played d3, only then do you play e captures d4 and then knight captures d4. I think this was Steinitz's idea that somehow this was a big improvement on the old Philidor lines because you were gaining this tempo on the e4 square. And of course Steinitz also liked to play all kinds of goofy ideas. I think mostly he, he always would claim that it was for some really clever reason in the middle of the board or pawn structure reason, but I think it was really just because the opposition back then wasn't very good People didn't know how to attack. People didn't know how to defend properly. And you could just get away with a lot back then. Uh, you do this kind of stuff in modern chess and you get into a lot of trouble really quickly. Uh, so anyways, in that particular game, the game continued with this move, bishop to d7. Now, it is interesting to note uh, that one of my favorite games of all time was this move, pawn to g6. And I love this game because it was actually Capablanca playing the black pieces against Nimzovich. And Nimzovich, I guess, got excited and decided to win a pawn. So Nimzovich played knight capture c6 here, and then b capture c6, and then played queen a6 and went after the pawn on c6. And you actually can't defend it. And then what Capablanca did was he gave it up. He played queen d7, and then he gave up the pawn on a7. But after bishop g7, Capablanca has almost this Banco Gambit-esque kind of position where he intends to bring both of the rooks to the open files, and he intends to... Uh, reposition his knight and reposition some other pieces but basically just put a whole bunch of pressure on the b2 and a2 squares on these two open files and actually probably not only does black have enough compensation for the pawn here maybe even black has an advantage it's really difficult to say but capablanca didn't repeat this experiment and i don't think it was because he was worried about people uh taking the pawn i don't think he was worried about knight takes c6 I think what he was concerned about was just in this position, bishop g5 was very, very possible. And honestly, this bishop g5 is probably just decisive advantage white. Just bishop g5, bishop g7, castle's queen side should just be decisive advantage white. White has a huge development lead, a huge advantage, huge space advantage, just in sort of the traditional way that you would expect. Uh, the computer gives this as decisive advantage white. So this is the problem. And even if you go back to the main line uh, that Steinitz was playing, you know, if you go back to the main line with bishop d7, this is still sort of the problem. Just moves like bishop g5, f3, h4, they should all yield major advantage white. Now, Steinitz's opponent played castle's kingside. Uh, Pillsbury played castle's kingside. And this actually lets... Uh, black back into the game a little bit although pillsbury i will note did actually beat steinitz uh in this line so he beat steinitz in his steinitz variation uh but if you go forward a little bit to like 1914 instead of castle's kingside you do have an example of bishop g5 uh from capablanca uh where he played this in buenos aires back in 1914 he played bishop g5 and then after bishop e7 then he castled castled and then you have rook a d1 and capablanca had an advantage with the white pieces and Capablanca went on to win with white. So you do have future players finding the move bishop g5 in this position. But anyways, you had castles kingside by Pillsbury, then you had bishop e7 and then you had b3. Again, you know, a little a little goofy, but Pillsbury's coming up with a plan and he's sticking to it. After castles, we play bishop b2, c6, rook a d1, queen c7, rook fe1, rook fe8, and then you have knight on d to e2, which I wince just to look at the move, because now 
Now Steinitz is actually back in the game. But unfortunately for Steinitz, Pillsbury did know how to attack. And after a few more mistakes from Steinitz, we'll just sort of fast forward here, Pillsbury did manage to figure out how to get a good attacking structure eventually. And he managed to maneuver his pieces in and finally finish uh, Steinitz off with this really great move, just knight f6, decisive advantage white. So finally making the kingside attack break through, even though there were a bunch of mistakes from both sides uh, that I just kind of glossed over right there. But knight f6 is decisive advantage white, the point being after gf6 he has this move queen h4 check, uh, which is just absolutely decisive because, of course, he plans on taking uh, on the f6 square with the bishop, and it's hard to counter this. King g8, bishop f6, there's the dual threat of bishop takes rook and queen h8 mate. You, of course, have to stop the more dangerous one. You have to stop the mate threat, and then he simply took the rook, and then you have a captures b4, and then you have rook takes d6. Bishop to e6, a captures b4, queen b4, rook e d1, queen c3, bishop e7, and there's nothing left to play for because white is just up too much material. So that was Pillsbury versus Steinitz played in Vienna back in 1898. So that's kind of uh, a lot of where the theory sort of sits right now is white in this old Steinitz variation should just have an advantage after d4. If they play e takes d4, I recommend going down Anderson's path with queen d4. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, and I think we can just follow that Anderson versus Paulson game from 1873. I don't really think that there's been any major improvements since then. And if they play sort of the more modern concept here, which is bishop d7, I think we do just play knight to c3, and then we have knight f6, and then we have bishop c6, bishop c6, queen d3. And then, of course, we can actually follow uh, most of even the old Steinitz uh, game. Uh, after e takes d4, we can play knight takes d4, and then after, say, g6, we would have an advantage with bishop g5. We're not going for the pawn like Nimsevich did. And, of course, after just about anything else, we're going to have an advantage with bishop to g5. You know, bishop d7, we're going to have the same thing, bishop to g5. Uh, it is noteworthy that a few other things have been tried here. Uh, we had one game continue with knight to d7 in this position. Uh, this was played in Grischuk versus Ivanov, played back in 2010. That game continued with knight c6, bc6, and uh, white had some sort of advantage here. White actually continued with queen a6, which is... Sort of a similar idea, almost, to the uh, nimzovich capablanca game. But White had some sort of advantage in this position, and Grishchuk did go on to win. Another interesting side note is I have this game, uh, Kaspara versus Wend Wendling, played in 1998, uh, that continued with the move d5 here, which I don't think we ever need to repeat. Uh, Kasparov had a huge advantage after Knight captures e5, uh, and won the game relatively easily. And I don't know how Kasparov always gets these gifts. I've mentioned it before in my other videos, but people seem to like to try really weird stuff against Gary Kasparov, and Gary Kasparov usually wins the games fairly easily. Uh, you know, the point is that there's there's no tactical resource here. We're going to play queen c4, which threatens f7 and threatens the bishop. When the bishop moves, we have queen to b5 check. c6, queen takes b7, and then after rook c8, Kasparov played knight d5. And, of course, there's a threat on the f7 square, so you're just down a piece here. You can't actually play anything. You know, queen take d5, we lose the rook. If pawn captures d5, we have mate on f7. So that's a pretty straightforward refutation to d5, just knight captures e 5 uh, But, in effect, white should just have some sort of advantage here after queen to d3, and then e takes d4, and we're taking back with the knight. Uh, these positions should just be slight edge white. Anyways, that's how you face the old Steinitz variation. I hope you found this video helpful. I hope you learned something new about chess, and I hope you can use some of these ideas in your own games. Thank you very much for watching.